Welcome to the Mercy Cast, where we're learning the art of compassion through the adversity of life. I'm your host, Raleigh Sadler. Today, I want to talk about healing. This is something that faces each of us, whether we want to acknowledge it or not. Many of us are dealing with pain that we've been carrying for far too long, luggage that has been on our back for longer than some of us can remember. How do we let go? How do we heal? How do we recover? Well, today we're going to learn that it's very hard to heal without others being in your camp. It's hard to heal without community. Jamie had no idea that she was trafficked at the time she started attending a local Bible study. Several of the facilitators recognized that she really wasn't in a good place. Over time, she began volunteering at a local pregnancy center with someone that she'd met at the study. It was during this time that she started feeling this compulsion. She began to have a desire to go to this conference that was talking about human trafficking. While she was attending the conference, she heard the leaders break down human trafficking bit by bit. And as they were unveiling what it was, she realized that they were sharing her story. I'm joined by Jamie Cowick the president of Yana Recovery Center of Fort Lauderdale. Jamie, welcome to the Mercy Cast. Thank you for having me. And so I've known Jamie just a little while now. We did an event at a church in South Florida, and it was phenomenal because she shared her story. And anytime we share our stories, I think it's a courageous act. Anytime we talk about the things that we have gone through, I think it, it almost takes bravery to be willing and to be able to do that. But she shared this story with people, many of whom she didn't know. And it was so incredible to see how the light bulbs were coming on with people where they were thinking, well, I have vulnerabilities as well. And I've been through things as well. And just seeing people make that connection, I think, is so important. And so I had to have Jamie on the Mercy Cast because I feel like she lives, she really lives the heartbeat of this podcast. And so, Jamie, you're sitting there, you're at this Bible study, you don't really know kind of what's been going on in your life at this point, but other people are starting to recognize, maybe not recognize that you've been trafficked, but recognizing that something wasn't right, like not everything was perfect in your life. And you meet this person in the Bible study who is working at a pregnancy center, and you start volunteering, and for you... What led you to volunteer in that way? I wanted to give back. Um, You know, I've always had this compassion for people, for others in my life. When I graduated high school, I wanted to become a therapist. And I had no idea what that would all entail. And, you know, I had to go through what I went through in order for me to become the therapist I am today. You know, I think that is so on point when we have gone through heavy things and experienced a great deal of pain, it does open our eyes to the needs of others. And just as the point of this podcast is learning the art of compassion through the adversity of life, here you are, you face something horrible. And that in itself led you down a road to caring for others who'd gone through something similar. Am I correct in that? Yes, absolutely. And so you're at this pregnancy center and you're hearing about this conference and you're feeling this compulsion to go. Tell me more about that. What was going on when you're hearing about this conference? Why why was this conference different than any other conference that I'm sure would advertise to a place like where you were volunteering? You know, we would go to different conferences already for... For the pregnancy centers, you know, for different pro-life events. But whenever they said the human trafficking, it just, God just pulled me there. You know, I, you really hadn't heard it too much at the time. And God just put this on my heart that I had to go. Wow. 
I had no idea what I was in for or anything, but God just put it on like, you have to go. It was like he gave you a next step and you took that next step, not knowing where that would lead you. Yeah. And so walk me through the conference. So you get to this conference and they're talking about human trafficking. Yes. And they had, I think it was four women that were on stage telling their stories. And they had a couple of women also that had danced at local strip clubs also telling their stories. And I remember breaking down because this girl was telling me my, or telling the audience my story. And I just, I wept. I could not stop crying. And I finally realized what all had happened to me, you know, like, all of the trauma that I had faced over the last eight years was finally coming into, I guess, reality. Yeah. That And it made more sense to me after going to this conference. And it's kind of cool, too, because the, um, the school that I ended up going to for my bachelor's and my master's also sponsored this conference. And I was fighting with God like crazy on whether or not I was going to go to the school because I really didn't want to go to a Christian university. And God opened up the doors for me to go to the school as well. And I ended up graduating with my bachelor's and my master's there. I ended up meeting Judith, who is my partner, the vice president, and Oriana. I met her at the school. So God just like orchestrated everything. like. Step by step. You know, that's so refreshing to hear because a lot of times when we're trying to think through our future plans or we're trying to recover or heal from things that we've gone through, we're looking way into the future trying to figure out, well, how's this going to happen and how's that going to happen? And it seems in your story, you're starting to see the foundation being laid. Yeah, absolutely. You mentioned how your trauma, in a sense, became reality or you started to see it as reality. Could you tell me more about that? Well, you know, there was so many people that would be telling me that something was just not right. Like friends would would tell me whenever I first met my trafficker, like something is not right with this person. And, you know, all of the way that he would treat me, they would tell me to get away from this guy. and. I just, I couldn't get away from him because I just kept on gravitating more and more towards him. And, you know, the first year he offered me the world and not only did he buy me anything that I wanted, he also provided me all the drugs that I wanted because I am a recovering drug addict. And so he just... I had no idea at all what I was going through and what I was about ready to go through because it took, he went through the grooming process with me for about a year and I got pregnant and I ended up having an abortion. He forced me to have an abortion. I got pregnant again and he forced me to have another abortion. And those abortions caused me actually not to be able to have children. So. You know, and I was in foster care whenever I was younger too. And because of my biological parents being drug addicts. And so I ended up being called to the center just because like, you know, I could have been saved. I was saved from being aborted myself. Okay. So it was just everything. All these pieces were finally coming together. Yeah. It sounds like it was a major part of your story where you're like, You could kind of see just how everything intersected. Yeah, exactly. You mentioned a couple of things that that I want to kind of dig into. One is when a lot of people hear about human trafficking, they think, you know, in very binary ways, like someone has been trafficked and they know that they're trafficked and they want out and they need someone to come save them. And this is a very misguided view in most cases. I think oftentimes 
more often than not, people are groomed into situations of human trafficking, whether it's for sex, labor, domestic servitude. Somebody kind of tricks them or manipulates them through power and control. And, and often, what, one thing I've noticed over the years as we've worked with people and as I've met people who've been trafficked is that people who are being victimized don't often self-identify because mm-hmm. they don't know. And in many cases, though kidnapping can happen and does, overwhelmingly people are groomed into human trafficking. And you really shared this story of how the first year was different. And then the script is flipped. And then he's forcing you to take abortive measures. And he's really, in many ways, harming you. And so during that time, did a trauma bond form between you and your trafficker, which kind of kept you linked up with him? Absolutely. And it ended up lasting for over eight years. And so for some of our listeners, they may not understand what a trauma bond is. And I could try to explain it, but I really think you are the perfect person as someone who is working with people in recovery and working with people who've experienced immense trauma. How would you define a trauma bond for us? Trauma bonding is when like you get so enmeshed with each other. It's it's almost like a codependency relationship, only there is a lot of crucial trauma that has happened in the person's life. And there has been trauma that has happened in between the, the two people. So with me and him, I mean, we were, we were in a relationship. You know, this was my yeah. boyfriend that I, excuse me, that I trusted. Yeah. Or I tried to trust anyway. Right, right. And I'm sure he would always have an answer just in those moments where you're like, mm, I don't like this. And you'd probably always have a way, either smoothing things over or changing the subject to where you didn't ask the question. Uh, he had major power and control. He would lose his keys at a club, for example. This was like in this first year. And he would force me to go to the club he didn't want to go and go find his keys. So he would make you go. Yeah. Wow. And he would, he would go to jail for like a DUI and I would be the one that would have to bail him out. You know, it's, it's helpful for us as we are hearing your story to understand that human trafficking can often be murkier than a lot of people want to give it credit for. Even with trauma bonding, this is this enmeshment that's happening to where you know, it's not the most black and white situation. At that time, you were like, this is my boyfriend. We care for each other. Yeah. But the problem is when we're being, when we're in these traumatic situations, it's really hard to see things very clearly, you know, regardless of what level of trauma that we're in. And you mentioned as he was going through this grooming process with you that there was also an element of drug use and substance abuse going on. The cocaine I wanted, Xanax, anything, crack. So he would kind of like ply you with whatever drug you wanted to manipulate you or? Oh, definitely. Yeah, it's interesting when we think of things like drug use and like hardcore drug use where there's an addiction there. It's very easy for some people to say, oh, well, well, that's, that's the presenting issue. But they don't know that many people who are survivors of human trafficking, who are going through or who have been through difficult things, they were manipulated through drug use and so, or someone got them hooked on drugs. And this is one of the many tools in a trafficker's tool belt. And so now you're at this conference, you're realizing that the stories that all of these lived experience experts are sharing, they're kind of your story. Yeah. And it sounds to me like when you have a realization, when when things become super clear in our lives, we have to do something. There's a next step. It's almost like when you heard that, how did you respond? I actually went, I started going to a therapist. I went and actually I went and had a meeting with my pastor at the time and we talked about it. And, you know, he confirmed that, I mean, he really didn't know much about trafficking either at the time. 
but we talked about it and he actually gave me a voucher for therapy sessions. Oh, that's cool. And they paid for 10, yeah, they paid for 10 of my therapy sessions at a, a local counseling center. And so for you, as you were realizing that there was healing that you wanted, there was a healing journey that you wanted to embark on. Did those 10 therapy sessions help you on your road to recovery? They did. And, you know, a lot of the things that was covered in the therapy sessions, because they wanted to do EMDR on me, like right away. And a therapist actually tried to do that on me and I wasn't ready for it. And I, I relapsed because I would only be able to get like, you know, 60, 90 days sober. And then I would relapse because I, all this trauma was so yeah. fresh to me still. And now I have this realization of what happened to me. And I'm like, okay, now what? And so you have this realization. You're like, all right, what's next? They tried to do EMDR and, and you weren't ready for it. No, not at all. Well, I think it's so encouraging to know that you recently were licensed to do EMDR with clients, right? I am. Over the weekend was my last class. Oh, that is amazing. And could you share with us a little tiny bit of what is EMDR and how can that be helpful when people have experienced severe trauma? It stands for Eye Movement Desensitization and Reprocessing. And it has to do with your brain. So our brain is affected by trauma in a huge way. So, especially the frontal cortex. So what it does is there's different ways that you, the therapist will do the, the EMDR with you. There's tappers that you can hold. There is a, like a butterfly tapping that you can do, or you can do it by the eyes with your fingers. But what it does, the eye movements train our brain to process trauma in a different way, in a more positive way. That's how, like, I ended up going through 12 sessions of it later on in my recovery journey. And this is honestly on how I can, I think, be able to tell some of my story without breaking down and bawling my eyes out. Because it gets you out of that victim mentality, more of a survivor. Yeah. And all my clients now are like lined up for them or for me to do it on them. <laughs> it's like a movie almost, like you're playing the movie in your eye. And you found that to be very helpful in your process? Yes, I did. Yeah, I'm hearing more and more about EMDR. And I'd heard recently that the person that founded it used to go on these long walks and he was like, how do I simulate this? And then he kind of created EMDR out of that. And I, I think that's so intriguing because I know so many people who are dealing with really heavy things, they'll start something like, I'm going to just go walk. I'm going to go for a long walk. And they're like, why do I feel better when I walk? And kind of like what you said, it's that movie playing. It's your, your brain's in a sense being retrained. But I think EMDR is something that, I mean, it's so specialized and so focused to help someone when they may not have felt that other things have been helpful. Yeah. Because talk therapy, honestly, I mean, you can talk all you want, but talk therapy can only do so much. Yeah. With that extensive yeah. trauma. Yeah. And you even mentioned with the experience of trauma, people can relapse. And so that was part of your story. And when we relapse or fall back into things that we don't want to do anymore, it's very easy to feel stuck. How did you, how did you push through that? You know, I had some really, really awesome people, you know, surrounding me in my recovery journey because they see this, they, well, not now, but they saw this broken girl that, you know, was abandoned and had been rejected in her, her life and, you know, was told that she was never going to amount to anything. And so, you know, these people that I have had in my life have encouraged me and pushed me and supported me through, through so much, through 
work in the 12 steps, through therapy, through, mm-hmm. you know, the EMDR, through different other healing, like self-help studies that I've done. You know, I did Shelter from the Storm, which was amazing. And that Calvary Chapel does, before, Calvary Chapel before Latterdale does. And, you know, there was a whole chapter on confronting your perpetrator. And I remember doing it. And I like scribbled wow. out the whole entire chapter and was just like, I can't do this because the thought of me contacting him again, that's what my head was thinking was that I was going to have to contact him again. I'm like, I can't do this. There's not like, I finally got rid of him. He's going to reel me back in. You know, it just, I had the worst panic attack thinking that I had to do this. But they were like, you know, no, it's just writing letters or, you know, something like that. And I ended up having to write a letter to him, not mail it, but I ended up burning it. And it ended up being like 20 pages long, this letter. And it ended up burning into like this black rose. Yeah, it was super cool. But it was a very healing experience that I, this burning exercise. And so you were able to kind of just let go. Yeah. Yeah, I've found that symbols like that can be very helpful. I love how they're like, you don't have to send it to him. No. But writing letters, getting it out there, processing it, and then immediately doing something with it, I've found to be very helpful. And I think that's, that's incredible. That class that you went through helped you do that. Yeah. And there was other ones that I went through. And I remember one class that I went through that it was called Living Waters. And you had to name and break the soul ties. You had to name people that you had slept with. And I just, I froze. That, that was intimidating. I, it was in, you know, because I didn't know the names of the, some of the people that I had slept with or, you know, or the ones that had, the Johns that had raped right. me. I had no clue. So it was so, such an embarrassing exercise for me almost. That I just, and I felt almost stuck a little bit in this exercise that I couldn't let go of these soul ties because I had so many. And do you think the exercise was a healthy one? I I wonder sometimes if some of the things that are coming out of maybe Christian camps for people who are survivors who've gone through something, do you think that's a case-by-case basis kind of situation? Or maybe that's just a bad idea, that, that part for people who've gone through significant trauma? I think it's a bad idea. Yeah. 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 It, because you're sitting there trying to rack up your brain on how many people you had been with and when you don't have a clue. Well, and I think this is why survivor leadership is so freakishly important. Yeah. Because with what you're doing now, what you're doing at Yana, how you're helping people who have gone through similar things to you, you're able to speak into that in a way that is not going to be re-triggering. Because that's basically what you just described. You just described this idea of like re-triggering kind of a very non-trauma-informed approach. Like having you name all of these people that you'd been with that not the most trauma-informed thing I've ever heard in my life. No. And so now you're able to work in this way where you are coming with this lens of being trauma-informed and you know what could trigger people and you know how to kind of get to things without hurting people. And I think that's so important because I think a lot of people are well-meaning, especially in the church. There's a lot of really well-meaning people. But when it comes to trauma, when it comes to human trafficking, a, a lot of people are just out of their depth. They're overwhelmed. They don't know how to respond. So they either don't respond or they do the first thing that comes to mind, which is never really the best way to go about it. You know, it's, it's always no. going to be really messy, super awkward. But the way you're kind of leading out, I think, is so important because, I mean, even the way you described your own story, 
It's not this. People are trafficked. They just need to be rescued. And then everything's okay. Healing's a long journey and it requires a lot of people. And it requires, like, it, you need people in your corner. And so, have you found that in churches? Have you found that in churches that you've attended? People, maybe they didn't know what to do, but they kind of came alongside of you. They were part of your community, they were a friend. Did you experience that? I have. There's a church in Dania Beach, Lighthouse Community Church, and the pastors were just amazing when it came to, you know, pastoral counseling with me and, you know, having, giving me ideas of different women that can come beside me. And then Calvary Chapel, Fort Lauderdale, which is my home church, the Celebrate Recovery. You know, I met a woman in Celebrate Recovery that ended up becoming my sponsor for 12 years. And she she was just amazing. She ended up becoming a mother to me. And she she really showed me what a, like a mother-daughter relationship is supposed to look like. That's incredible. Yeah. And, you know, I've met so many incredible people through Alcoholics Anonymous as well. You know, as you are talking about the 12-step programs, some of our listeners know this, but my organization that I started, Let My People Go, when we launched, we launched in the same church where most of the original steps of the 12 steps were pinned by a pastor, Sam oh. Shoemaker. And yeah, when I launched my book, I did it at the same church because for me, that was very important because I think, I think when someone's working the steps, they are very much recognizing their own vulnerability and their own need. When we realize that healing and change, as we kind of embrace reality, it can start to happen. It can start to trickle in or flood in. And that sounds like so much of your story is, as your eyes were opened, things started moving. Like as soon as you're like, okay, this is, this is what happened. Okay. Did you ever think that you would be starting an organization like Yana and then caring for people who'd gone through something similar? Never. I like pinch myself some things. Because this is, <laughs> this is something you love, helping people along yeah. the way. And how did, how did you get there? A friend, well, she's more of a mentor to me. She, she is the one that came to me and was like, you know, we should do something together. And the only thing we really ended up doing was she helped me with the name. And then she just kind of backed off. Okay. Yeah. And so, but as I was, you know, getting healing and going to school and, and meeting people and going to conferences and workshops on human trafficking and and then I got to sit on, you know, these calendar calls too for BSO when I was a case manager for human trafficking and for sit in with Stacy Roth for Girl Sport. BSO. Broward okay. Sheriff's Office, sorry. Yeah. So I got to hear some of these trafficking cases that they were investigating. I get to sit in on it as a part of my job. And so God kept on leading me to work with victims, you know, of, or survivors of human trafficking. And no matter how hard I tried to back away from it, God was like, no, 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 <laughs> you're not. You're going to do this because I've tried to back away from it so many times. And what continues to bring you back? Something will happen like, you know, like an event at Coral Ridge, for example, you know, and they'll ask me to tell my story. And then you have people encouraging you and to do this. And, you know, I had professors, too, that kept on telling me not to give up because I'm a, I used to be such a runner. I would run from all my problems. Yeah. And it's hard to heal when you're running away from healing, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. So, and I never would finish what I started to, and, but God on, with this is, I mean, he literally has been, you're not giving up on this. And then, you know, we did, or before our event, you know, I was on Moody Radio 
talking a little bit about how important safe houses are. And and then now we had an organization contact me after the event offering to possibly buy us a safe house. So it's little things like that that keep on happening. You know, that's that's so key. And these moments where you're like, wow, how are we even going to keep the lights on? And then all of a sudden God provides yeah. something or there's a big gift or yeah. there's a connection that's helpful or something in it. It's like those little tiny wins kind of keep you coming back. They kind of keep you going. Yeah. Because we always try to, we can, it's, I think it's very easy for humans to catastrophize things and be like, oh my gosh, how are we going to do this? How's this going to work? Should we quit? And then it's, the, it's that little quiet voice. It's those little tiny things that happen that we may not even be perceiving that all of a sudden we notice and we're like, okay, there's something here. You know, if there's smoke, there's fire. Like there's, there's something going on right now. God has definitely put that fire in me. And then, you know, of course I had to go see the movie, Sound Uh for Freedom. And, you know, now I've had all these people that have, you know, Facebook messaged me or text me or called me asking me, you know, in what ways that they can help. And so these people are reaching out to you now because they saw the movie and they're hearing about human trafficking and they want to do something and they know enough about you or they know that you've been out there, you, you're, you started Yana. And so they're like, how can we help? Can we, can we give? Can we, can we volunteer? Are they asking just kind of a lot of different things? Mostly volunteering, you know, and like, what can we do when you guys go out on your outreaches? Because about once a month, we go out and do outreaches and talk to the... I live in Hollywood, and we go out and we talk to the women that are on the streets in Hollywood. Okay. We're prostituting, and we give them love bags. Okay, so so you're going out into Hollywood. You're really doing a relational-type ministry. You're getting to know people on the street, kind of hearing where they are, and then giving them toiletries and makeup, things like yeah. that. Yeah. And then we do like little events like for Valentine's Day, we did one and we, you know, put little journals in there and we put little Valentine's Day candies and gave them roses just to know that they are loved by somebody. And as you're doing that, have you been able to build some good relationships? Yeah, we have. That's awesome. That's awesome. I think that's so important. It's connecting with people. And not everyone will feel called to do outreaches like that. But what I, what I love about it, what I love about outreaches like that is, again, sometimes our response to human trafficking is very transactional. We need to go fix the problem. We need to go rescue the person. When ultimately, it's just getting to know someone and allowing them to open up on their terms, if they even do. I think that is just so important. And it sounds like as you are leading this and you're bringing your team and you're training people who want to volunteer, I think that's so helpful because it's really hard to care for people who are in the margins when someone might not recognize their own privilege and also when someone doesn't really have a guide to kind of walk them through of, here's how we have a conversation. And we'll pray with them also. We'll always ask them if they need prayer. And we had one not too long ago that it was, the situation was so sad. We prayed for her and one of my volunteers actually prayed for her and she just broke down crying. And then we went around the block and then saw that her trafficker what her pimp was with her again. And we went again because we wanted to pray with her again to see if she needed prayer again and she wasn't there. And the first thing that we thought about was, you know, is she being beat up right now? Is she being sold right now? And it just, it, it broke all of our hearts. And when I first started doing this, I was getting triggered like crazy. Yeah. But as I'd gone more and did more outreaches, you know, it just, it breaks my heart. Well, one thing that I've seen as just we've had this conversation that in your healing journey, people have always been a major part of it. Safe people, healthy people. 
And as you have healed and as you've grown and as you've found your passion now, you desire to see others heal. But what's interesting is you're not doing it just by yourself. You're bringing along other people to kind of bring this community into the lives of people who may not be experiencing healthy community right now. And so as we end our time, what are a couple of pieces of advice or encouragement that you could give our listeners as they're trying to think through how can they respond to human trafficking or those who've experienced severe trauma? If you have a severe trauma, I would say you need the unconditional positive regard. But, you know, slowly start opening up yourself to the people that are trying to help you and to love you. Because, you know, those of us that have suffered severe trauma, we don't know how to accept the love that's been given to us because, especially us that are survivors, because the way that we perceive love is through trauma. And so, you know, try to try to open up yourself to those that care and love you and and that want to help you. You know, it's it's hard to do because the trust factor for us survivors, I mean, there is no trust. And we gradually have to, you know, start trusting those that that do love us. What does it look like to open oneself up? to that because it it does sound scary especially if someone has experienced something like that oh yeah absolutely i mean it you have to continue to get to know that person to see and kind of see about using wisdom you know if you feel like you can trust that person if you feel that person is safe yeah because there has been people that i have opened up to in the last 15 years that i've been and, out and they weren't that safe were not no, my last relationship that I got into was exactly that way. And it was the first relationship that I got into after everything that had happened to me. And, you know, he, he started acting that way. And during COVID, his true colors really showed out. And, you know, tried to use that control on me again and stuff like that. And, if anybody tries to control me now, even if it's my boss, for example, I will get yeah. triggered. And that's something that I have to work on every single day. So to be able to trust somebody, that's something that we have to work on every single day. It's not an overnight process. I mean, this could take years. And, you know, there's the people that I do have in my circle are ones that have proven to me over and over and over that they are safe and that I I can trust them no matter what and they'll be there for me no matter what, no matter what happens. I mean, I had a relapse six years ago and six and a half years ago and my my support system was right there and now I have six years of sobriety. But That's incredible. Thank you. I mean, that's that's really incredible. And as you're sharing this, my brain keeps going to the other side of you're kind of speaking to people who have experienced trauma and encouraging them. But on the other side of people who are befriending people who could have been trafficked or, you know, are processing their own trauma, I think they need to see that mirror effect too of being a friend is, it's a real deal. Like it's, friendships are messy. and. Trust is something that needs to be earned. Yeah. And we have to kind of own what we're bringing in with us. We have to own kind of our own stuff as we're getting to know other people who've gone through things. You know, and I still go to therapy and, you know, those that are around me, you know, encourage me to go. Have you seen your therapist lately? (laughs) Because they can just tell I start getting like all like out there. They'll be like, I have one good friend that will literally say that. Have you seen your therapist lately? I'll be like, no. She's like, well, you need to get off the phone with me and call her now and make an appointment. And that's helpful. It is. Well, and it's, it's interesting because I it think is. sometimes in friendships, we have to understand what may be kind of above our pay grade, so to speak. Like, you know, there, there are times where I may not have the physical, emotional 
whatever energy to really be someone's therapist, but I can be a friend and I can encourage someone yeah. to go to therapy. Yeah. And I, I think that's, I think that's important for us to recognize God's not calling us to fix people. He's not calling us necessarily to, to be heroes. He's calling us to be neighbors. And, yeah. and part of that is it's to be a friend. And it's, if there's something where you're like, I can listen, but I don't, I don't really know what to do, but I can listen. I can be your friend. I mean, that is what a big step in caring for someone who's gone through something. And it helps too, you know, if you have, I mean, it, it's really helped me having someone too that is a friend of mine that is also a survivor. I mentioned the book Stolen and then I know the author very well. And, you know, she, I can call her too and just be like, I'm dealing with this right now. And she'll be like, Jamie, I understand. And sometimes that's enough, right? Just to know that you've been heard, just to know that you're, you're seen in that moment. Yeah. And she, she is a survivor as well. She is. That's incredible. That like you have someone that you can talk to as you're processing these things. I think really what's important is you didn't do this alone. Even when you were talking about your sobriety, you weren't white knuckling yourself into sobriety. You're doing this with people. You have counselors, you have friends, you have community who's walking with you through this process. And I would just encourage anyone, if you're, if you're struggling, if you're going through something difficult right now, don't do it alone. Find one person, someone that you think is safe and, and just track with them. Because when we try to fix our problems or we try to save ourselves on our own, we don't necessarily end up where we thought we would. And I just love, I love that about your story. There's always this element of community, almost at every turn. And I had moved away from this area a couple of years ago and I had to come back. I just moved, you know, another place in South Florida. And I felt the disconnect from my community. And I had to move back because I missed it so much. And I, it just wasn't yeah. the same. And I think that's something ultimately that we all need is we need community and we need people in our corners and we need friends and, and opportunities to have our perspective challenged and widened kind of like with the work that Yana does. And if you're listening to this and you want to hear more about what Yana's doing, there will be a link in the show notes that you can check out. And so go there. And that said, Jamie, thank you. If you are interested in more conversations like this one, buy my book, Vulnerable Rethinking Human Trafficking. If you want bonus episodes, as well as a plethora of other resources, become a paid member at lmpg.org for $10 a month. You will get access to our bonus podcast, More Mercy, where we dive deeper. Also, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and leave MercyCast a five-star review. We want to hear from you, so you can email us at info at mercycast.com. Till next time. Have mercy on yourselves and each other.